Welcome into the CHGO White Sox Post Game Show. Presented by PointsBet. Use promo code CHGO when you sign up to get two risk free bets up to $2,000. Welcome into Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. And alongside me is the full CHGO White Sox crew. We got Vinny Duber on the far left. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. And the man in the middle is Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him on Twitter at Ecknerwall23. He is the CHGO White Sox community leader. We are joining you after a White Sox loss. Mm. The White Sox lose in 10 innings, 3-2 to two, to the Tigers. Herb, how are you feeling? Feeling terrible. The White Sox really didn't show up offensively. I mean, Matt Manning was part of that. He was pretty decent. I don't think he was extraordinary, but the White Sox couldn't see him too tough. Lucas Giolito, while not a good outing, he gave the team a chance to win this game, but too far, uh, too little people hitting balls. Like, Elvis Andres pretty much carried the offense. I think he got three hits today. Everybody else with uh, Singletons, if they did get hit, so it was very sad to see the offensive imp- output they had yesterday in Cleveland to the offensive input uh, output they had today in Detroit. They're all must-win games, so these wins, these losses hurt a little bit more. Detroit's only had two wins versus the White Sox in Detroit, both crushing defeats by the Detroit Tigers over the White Sox the opening day and then today. You did this, Vinny. You, I, you, I did what? You you cursed the team. You were like, oh, really? yeah, Liam Hendricks on the mound. Uh, I remember last time him and Javi Baez what faced happened? off. You jinxed. I'm just saying. It was all my fault. It was all, Javi Baez, they radioed, though. They radioed. Sean immediately got on the horn to the Tigers. They're like, all right, this is it. I'm just saying. Um, we got Herbie LaRusso over here today, whose mood, entire mood is dictated by whether the White Sox win or lose. Oh, that's <laughs> always that way. So you guys have more in common than you'd think. Oh, but man, um, we, him are tight. But everything else you said was correct. Yeah, man, this offense. We, we we saw it a lot for the first five months of the season. Haven't seen it too much over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but man, it was back with a force tonight. Uh, the, nobody hit. Right. Nobody hit. I mean, hey, you guys can complain about Lucas Giolito all you want. You can complain about Liam Hendricks all you want. You'd be wrong. He was fine. He got two outs. But uh, you can complain about any number of other things that you'd like. The number one thing, they didn't hit the GD ball. Well, and the number 28, 8 thing, 27th thing. How many men are on the roster now? 20, 28. 28. 28. Yeah. The 28th thing that you wouldn't complain about is Elvis Andres at this point, who went yeah. three for five. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the one guy that you really can't look at and be like, what are you doing right now? Um, Clark recently brought up uh, in our comments – you know, what, what has changed with the White Sox over the past two weeks? And I looked at, like, you know, are they not chasing as much? Are they hitting less ground balls? No, no. They were just literally hitting more home runs. So if they're not hitting home runs, like tonight, they're probably going to lose. Well, yeah, but some hits would have been fine as oh, well. Yeah. Their usual singles barrage probably would have yielded more than two runs, uh, you know, and, and those two runs they got were on an extremely clutch hit by Jose Abreu, I believe, with two outs. Yep. Um, you know, they finally got a couple of teams on – or a couple of guys on base at the same time, and, and Abreu cashed them in. They felt like 2020 all over again with a, with right. a clutch knock from, uh, from Jose, but – you know, they needed far more of those kind of situations, and they just had none to speak of. I mean, it's one thing to do what they do, uh, what they had done frequently throughout the season, which was get a bunch of guys on base and then come up empty. Tonight, they didn't even have the guys on base, and the offense was just nowhere to be found tonight against a team that they should beat. Right. Uh, it is a, you know, we, we heard we talked, uh, you know, whether it was yesterday or in the pregame today, you know, you're expe- you're hoping for two out of three here, and you can be realistic and hope for that, sure, but the White Sox have the mentality that they're going to go in and win every game. And when you look at the matchups on paper, they should win every game in yep. this series because the Tigers are really bad. bad. And so to let a game against this caliber of team get away on a night when the Guardians look like a playoff team making a sensational comeback and winning in a thrilling fashion uh, in Cleveland over the Minnesota Twins, it's a big missed opportunity for the White Sox because you have this – "Quote unquote easy game." I know they nobody on the team or no you know the manager be it be it Tony or Miguel are not going to say oh we think this guy these guys are easy and we're overlooking these guys. But this is the opportunity you got to make up ground to to yep. to uh, catch. Heck, they could catch the 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 Guardians here if yeah. they were to sweep and the Guardians were to fall apart against the Twins. That's not what happened on on this Friday night and uh, an opportunity very much by the boards for the White Sox. And the thing is. The Tigers played worse than the White Sox. Javi Baez, for all the offensive exploits, 
The going home, I don't too much um, disagree with it, but he was out by a good margin on the uh, called third strike. Spencer Torkelson, what the, f- what is he doing? <laughs> he was the one who struck out there. It's a drop third, and that ball goes pretty much halfway to first. If he shows any type of hustle, he makes it to first, and maybe Javi doesn't come home. Maybe he does. Or, but, this, or, but Spencer gets in the way of of yeah. Joe Kelly or gets in the way of Yasmani Grandal. There's a lot of things. They, Javi made two errors himself. Spencer made an what should have been an air where AJ Pollock turned to the left after he made a after Javi made his air. They could have tagged AJ Pollock there. It was a lot of bad play by Detroit, and the White Sox still lost that game. Let's set this up a bit more, uh, yeah. just because we're jumping in and okay. just getting all of our feelings out at one point. Uh, we'll pick it up in the seventh uh, or eighth inning, so you know Herb can you know immediately start talking about this uh, as fast as he can. The White Sox let Matt Manning pitch all over him. Uh, seven innings tonight. He was fantastic. We'll go a little bit more in depth on why he was good. But Joe Jimenez uh, comes out for the Tigers in the top of the eighth, and the White Sox start to find some life. Grandal flied out to uh, left to start the inning. Then Josh Harrison doubled down the left field line. Uh, he revved up those engines, uh, high-stepped a little bit on his old team. Then Elvis Andrus reached on an, an infield single to third base. They originally ruled it as an error even though it was just a hot shot to the third baseman yep. um it was it was a fairly you know fairly hard play to make there uh at third base it was hit pretty much right too i mean he had to step two steps to his right right but i mean elvis and he booted it smacked it um and then Moncada filed out to first um which was a crazy play where Spe- spencer torkelson goes into the white Sox dugout flips over the banister and leary garcia pulls him out of the dugout Basically by just his prevents him pr- from pants. falling into yes. the dugout is what he Head did. First. Yeah, right. Yeah. So let's have a quick discussion about sportsmanship. Very quick. You'd be uh, very quick. L- Len Casper jokingly said, let him fall. I would be fine with it. No, you have to be a human. You see a man in danger. Like, what are we Guided doing? That's a, that's a big, huge fall down there. Yes, you're second and third. You get a, the advance of runners if he goes in the dugout, but also... Spencer Torkelson might be in grave danger there. He he was just catching the ball, and then it went head first, and Lurie grabbed him by the belt and made sure he didn't go down there. I applaud Lurie for that. And, yes, you could say that the team comes before him, but, no, human moments come before anything else. And, I, you know, I would never say to somebody, let him fall in. Now, if he's just falling in and he might have a little injury, cool. But when he's going head first, you gotta, you got to save him from doing that. Give Larry Garcia a profile and courage award. That's what I have to say. Damn. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, so, Larry Garcia saved Spencer Torkelson from death. death. Um, <laughs> Josh Harrison did advance to third on the play. So, Sox had runners at first and third. And then Jose Abreu doubled down the line again in left. Andrews scored from first. Harrison scored easily from third. Elvis Andrews had a fantastic night. Um, he was running all over the place. He had a stolen base. Um, he advanced on a very tight play on a sacrifice fly earlier. Again, he went three for five today. He said we need to make a statement game on Thursday. He played great on Thursday, and he was the one Sox hitter to show up today. He was fantastic on the base paths. He was fantastic with the bat today. So I just want to give uh, extra love to Elvis. Well, I'll say two things. First of all, extra, even more love to Elvis that in the ninth inning there when or in the tenth inning rather when he gathered the infield on the mound to 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 go out and and have some sort of uh you know meeting there with uh, uh while Liam Hendricks was pitching guys on base he kind of took charge of the infield there and yeah shortstop's probably supposed to do that a lot of the times but it's a veteran guy making a veteran move right there good for him that's that's the kind of thing when all these people line up and say oh my god El- Elvis is sparking the team Elvis is doing this yeah, right. That's the kind of thing that that you might not have seen, or you wouldn't have seen from you know certain guys when when this was happening all through the first five months of the season. That's a good move by it's, him. It's veteran leadership, and he's not afraid. Like he's been right. in that dugout for what twenty six games now. This yeah. is twenty six game. He's not afraid. He's not you know bowing out to anybody. Jose Abreu has been on that infield longer than he has. Um, he's not afraid. I think it's you know fantastic to know. Absolutely. That. And then the other thing I would say was about that inning where he's running the bases. That was his. Th- Second, third time on base, I believe, already. Mm -hmm. He's at first base. He steals second. And then he goes to third, like you said, on that pretty medium-depth fly ball to center field. Uh, Maybe not the smartest base running move, but the aggression in the the situation has to be applauded because I I go back to earlier in the season, and and this is something that was was a negative for a lot of people, when, uh, you know, Joe McEwing sends a runner home from from – third base and sends him home to score and thrown out at the plate. And what does Tony La Russa say? 
We're not scoring any runs. He's right. got to do something. We got to do something, right? Elvis Andrews taking it upon himself to try to do something because the White Sox offense was dead for the majority of this evening, and he almost – he was the tying run at that point. It was only one nothing at that point. Yep. He would have tied the game had he he be able to come home from third base. Well, we're going to jump a little bit now. I mean, it, it kind of goes into this discussion. Like, I mean, that's the one thing the White Sox haven't been able to do. I mean, you look at extra base taken uh, percentage. Like the White Sox are are well below league average. I mean, they just don't have the speed. Um, they really just don't have the base running acumen. Is what we've seen from this White Sox team. Um, they do are, are are able to tie up the game in the top of the eighth with that Abreu double. Uh, then Jimenez grounded out to end the inning. Uh, but then Javi Baez doubled to center and basically talking about that extra base ta taken uh, moment. Baez basically singles up the middle, and then A.J. Pollock in center field just doesn't have the arm to deliver it accurately and strong enough where you could have gotten Baez at second there. And that's where the White Sox, again, if they make it to the postseason, are going to lack yep. against teams against the like the Astros or Yankees or Guardians, as we've seen. Like That's what scares me about the next three games against the Guardians is you know Andres Jimenez can do that. Jose Ramirez can do that. Um, it's just very scary that the White Sox really haven't been able to figure this out. And Luis Roberts' wrist injury prevents him from being the one out in center field where he probably makes a little bit more of an accurate um, and athletic play there. So it's just frustrating seeing that come back. And even if we want to jump to the 10th inning, um, I know it didn't matter in the long run because, again, that the, the actual base runner doesn't score. Um, but Liam Hendricks fielding the bunt and then throwing a slider over to yeah, first base. Yeah. Um, the defense is just a killer for the yeah. Sox and has been all year. And Steve even put it up there where you're talking about the Javi Baez double there the pitch was terrible I mean yeah. Joe Kelly was performing well before that I've said it time and time again Javi Baez has walked 25 times this year and Lucas Giolito contributed to the 25th today you don't have to get him out in the zone Prefer preferably don't pitch him any pitches in the zone it was a high slider 91 miles per hour We've seen Javi Baez for all the years he was here with the Chicago Cubs. The one thing you can hit is a fastball, and another thing you can hit is a mistake slider or changeup or curveball in the zone. So 91, it probably wasn't where Joe Kelly wanted it, elevated up in the zone, but you can't make the mistakes to Javi Baez. You're going to miss, miss outside. He will swing at it. Like his career has shown you that he'll swing at anything, especially – uh, velocity that is elevated and uh, sliders that are outside the strike zone. So it was a great pitch. He didn't execute his pitch. I'm sure he was mad at himself. Eventually, he uh, rectified the situation. Yeah, uh, real quick, uh, I do see some people saying the season's over. Um, one of them's a Cubs fan, so I'm just going to ignore Shane right now because uh, I, I just see him consistently in the uh, CHGO Cubs chat, so I just know he's uh, poking the bear here. Uh, but even Matt Farrington down there saying season's toast. Tonight, tonight was the final straw. Not really. Not at all. Um, Dave Brees is right. Uh, backs against the wall when this team will play tomorrow. If they win on Saturday, if they win on Sunday, um, they'll be fine. They'll still be keeping, you know, treading that water. The White Sox then have three games on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, or Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday against the Guardians. If they're able to take care of business in that series, series the season's back on, right? We, we, we can't just keep turning the lights back on and off, right? You know, the, the Guardians was that must-win game. They can afford to, you know, quote unquote, lose this game. You're not, you're not wrong, hundred percent, right? Math is math. Uh, the problem is, you know, they can't. They, you called it, I believe, in the whether it was yesterday or in the pregame show. You called this series a tune-up. It's not what it is. Series are this series is game three games that count, and and the Guardians are playing a team that plays them tough. I, I think we saw – we had the Guardians-Twins game on the other TV, yep. and we saw them put up a stat that says every game the Guardians has won against the Twins this year has been three three runs or fewer. Yep. Mm -hmm. that, seven, I mean, seven one run wins that for the Guardians. Is, that, is, that goes to show you that not only are the Guardians good at winning that kind of game, but the Twins play them tough. Yep. And, 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 that does, and that should go to show you that the, the Guardians are not going to just plow their way through this weekend, this five-game series this weekend. The, the the Sox need to win these games yes. in Detroit. They got too much. They 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 blew an opportunity today uh, with the offense going to sleep against a bad team. The offense needs to come to play the next two days because they have an opportunity to change this deficit in the in the in the standings to make their lives easier when Cleveland comes to town next week. And so far, they haven't done that. And I understand the the thought of man, the season's over. But like, how many times have you said that? How many times have we said that this year? And then literally the next day, Colorado, we were like, oh, man, season's over after yeah. he lost on Wednesday. The next day you go to Cleveland and whoop them. And then today, season's over again. Tomorrow, I guarantee. 
to 510 start, I believe, Central Time. At about 8, 10, you'd be like, man, Sox are great, man. We're, we're back. And then you could have Cleveland Guardians losing two games tomorrow to the Minnesota Twins. Not very likely because they have Shane Bieber going to the bump and two guys you, you've never heard of from the Minnesota Twins <laughs> going to the bump for them. And uh, Connor Pilkington, former White Sox, great uh, farmhand. And then I cap for the Cleveland Guardians. Tomorrow you can be feeling awesome. So I get the emotions tonight, and it was a terrible loss. You lose to the Tigers. But you win two games this weekend. You have Johnny Cueto going to the bump tomorrow night, and then you have Michael Kopech going to the bump on um, uh, Sunday morning. You can right. win those two games easily just by those two guys pitching well and the White Sox giving you the two runs they gave you tonight. And Matt Farrington saying great teams win those games. What? The White yeah. Sox aren't great. Hate to break it no, to that, that great <laughs> like, team stuff has gone out the window. Long gone. They're not even a good team. I, I they're mean, a mediocre team, and that's 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 could be good enough to win this division. They're an uninspiring team in the AL Central that the GM did not add to at the trade deadline. I mean, like they're they're clearly not well, a eventually did. great team. Yeah, after the biggest Elvis Andres. I gotta give him charity credit, man. From the, PCB, charity baby. from Oakland. Hey, man. That's charity from Oakland. Hey, if he didn't get him, <laughs> he would be off. here MF and Rick Hahn, but I gotta give him credit. When he does things, give him credit. He did a great job right there with Elvis Andres. No? What's with the face? He, no? What's with the face? Let's go to the joke. Hey, man. Hobby, hobby. I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I think I've said my, my piece about that. Hey, Again, man, I'm not like, the biggest Rick Hahn fan, but. Credit where it's due. It's good. It's a good move. You're, hey, two things can be true. It's, it's You're allowed more. to blow the trade deadline and pick up some guy off the scrap heap, and it turns out to be good. Yeah, it's not the scrap heap though. I mean, like, mean it's not I, the it scrap, scrap heap. heap. They cut him. They DFA'd him. They're they, the worst they team in the They cut him. He, he said, "Please release me. I want more playing time." <laughs> right. That's the scrap heap. Anybody could have picked, anybody could have picked him up. How is it anyone, the scrap heap? Anyone could have picked it's him August up. In, it, it's August. It was the perfect scenario for him. They had a starting shortstop job of open for him. It was the place that he wanted to yes. go, and it was the place that needed him the most. That, it was just a perfect scenario. Remember, we had an open second base you gotta job. you got to make the layups. And, and open, it's fair. We had an open it's second fair, base but job. It's, it's still a layup. And we had an open right field <laughs> job. Michael Jordan's not the greatest basketball player of all time because he made the layups. Yeah. What, did we say that Rick Hahn was the greatest no, GM but I'm just, in but history? I'm just saying, like, yeah. I mean, like, anyone can do that. Like, sure, and I, he did it. I, good good job. I, yes. <laughs> but I'm saying, Sean, like, we'll get on You got to make those. Like, yeah, I, I don't yes. know. And that's what I'm saying. Like, if he didn't make that, we all would have been like, this motherfucker ain't shit. I got to give you him credit. You would have been watching Romy Gonzalez right. play shortstop right. for well, the well, last we, two weeks. We wouldn't be in this position right now where we're even at this point saying the season's The season would have been over at this point. And I'm saying he, Rick Hahn is a, a like, an A-plus General manager this year, I would give him a D. But for that move, that's an A plus move. I don't know. His two best moves have been Johnny Cueto and Elvis Andres. A. Very, very good moves. Yeah. Right. But also, like, I'm looking at the other 29 GMs and saying, "What? Why? Why did you do that?" Like, I just I question like why Johnny Cueto was available for so long and Elvis Andres. Why wasn't Elvis Andres playing for Oakland? Well, because Oakland is just a poorly run franchise. Yeah. But I, was, I just like I said, it's, and they're moving. It's, it's they're a leaving good, their city. It's a good move, and give him credit for that. And it, yes, he did have bad stuff for the most part of this year but uh i gotta give rick credit for that elvis i didn't even want elvis andres i was like oh that's just a name that people know he's like no he would help us out even though tim's hurt i told it you. would help us out i told you hey yes you did you learned you wanted yeah. him from the you were job. like treating him like he was manny machado oh my god you oh, has he been you almost <laughs> fell down the goddamn stairs before he got here <laughs> I was excited. Um, all right, before we continue our discussion about tonight's game, I want to let you know this football season points bet is bringing you a better way to bet live on games, which means before this ad is over, you can place a live same game parlay bet on the next drive uh, to be a touchdown and cash out your live second half over bet with points bet. You have access to more live football markets than ever before. Build the live same game parlay by combining your favorite bets anytime during the game, including spreads, totals, player props, and more choose the outcome of the next drive and next points with points bets, lightning bet. So whether you're on the move or on the couch, do it live on points bet, download the points bet app today and sign up with code CHGO to get two risk three bets up to $2,000. If you or someone who has a gambling problem and wants help, call 100 gambler for crisis counseling and referral services i do uh, recommend checking them out tomorrow uh for college football they'll likely give you a free bet that's not on uh, you know if they don't you know don't come blame me but that's just you know with a points bet power hour usually uh 12 to 1 p.m central standard time so uh, users if you're on the app in that area you might get a free bet so you know i'm just saying uh, it's, move it up, it's definitely worth downloading the app for college football they gonna, don't they got to move it up to like 10 to 11 maybe I don't know. I don't run the. I don't again. I don't run the points. Tell them to do power it. hour. Uh, I'll, I'll 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 talk to the people I know. Um, you know these people though. I You've do. used them. Oh, Game time. Love them. Oh, I you, used them too. 
You did? Yeah. Well, I got to them for tomorrow. I bought uh, some Red Stars tickets for tomorrow night. Nice. Look at that. Going down to Bridgeview. Did you get a, you get a, did you get a good deal? Sure. Yeah. Got a great deal. All yeah. right. Nice. First time going to Bridgeview, right? Uh, well, going to the actual park? First time I'll be in the in the park. Right. Yeah. I was at a music festival there a few weeks ago that was in the, uh, like, on the practice fields outside. Did you go to the day it got rained out? No, I went to the day that everybody got charged five grand for beers. Ooh, <laughs> sounds fun. That was uh, fun. That was a fun call from Amex the next morning. Game time doesn't control the beers. Uh, they, can, they don't control that, but they do control if you're going to get into the game and how low you're going to get into it and uh, how low is the main part because they guarantee the lowest price. Herb bought tickets to Truist Park. Vinny, you bought tickets to the Red Stars game. And, hey, if you see cheaper tickets, you could do what Herb did. Contact the people at game time and be like, hey, I found a cheaper ticket, and they'll guarantee your money 100, uh, for 110% back. Yep. Um, this is a app created by fans for the fans, and it guarantees the lowest price. You won't find a better deal this season on Red Stars tickets. You won't find a better deal on – Braves tickets. I don't know if we're talking about a lot of Braves fans, but when the Guardians come on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you won't find a better deal on Sox tickets in town. And Wednesday, we're thinking about going well, to the White Sox about Guardians game, and I'm going to use the Game Time app with the, my $46 credit that I got from a Game Time for the difference of the Braves tickets from a different website. It was that quick. 12 minutes later, after I sent the email with the proof that it was a lower price, they sent me my $46 credit. So me, Sean and I will be using that uh, credit to get tickets to the White Sox game. And I saw the tickets on Wednesday. One dollar is the lowest ticket right, right now. One well, single dollar and, and to get thing, into the ballpark. And we're not going to be sitting in no seats. So if you guys want to join us, you're welcome to join us. Well, and that's the thing, too. Like, you can get them for one dollar up in the nosebleeds if you want to sit, you know, all the way by the kids' deck. we got to have good seats right now, too. They have good seats for great prices. Um, I wanted There's to go $40 see. $40 ones in the gold box that day, too. There you go. Um, one dollar? Yeah. One dollar. That's it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I saw tickets. Just Chicago. sell a cup of lemonade and go to the Sox game. <laughs> you, you guys have gone to the Chicago theater right yeah no i've never been there oh really yeah oh I, I, my grandpa helped or my great grandpa helped build it that's cool as hell but i've never been there you should you should definitely you should take go. a tour you saw, should you, you should take a tour yeah that that's what well, we should plan a tour i saw amos lee and J, uh, ray lamontang there very nice yeah uh, i've seen a and couple. bill burr too okay i i, I saw uh sebastian Manicalco, Manicalco? Manicalco there oh. um john mulaney there i forget uh, a lot of different bands as well oh, um pavement's gonna be there and like Great seats there on the first floor, $32 for a pair. $16 each to see pavement? Well, I can't speak on pavement, but the Chicago theaters tickets are usually very expensive. Right. So yeah. That's so, a good deal. Yeah. Um, look in the description today, uh, whether it be in your podcast services or YouTube app, download that Game Time app and join over 15 million people who have downloaded the Game Time app and score the best seats to all your favorite events. All right, let's continue the talk here. Um, I guess I've just been, you know, really dragging out this ad read because I don't want to talk about this White Sox game. Um, let's go to that Baez uh, at bat again, just real quick against Kelly. Um, like you said, just not getting breaking balls low was the main issue uh, for Joe Kelly against Javi Baez here, but he was able to get the uh, breaking balls low against Spencer Torkelson. Uh, just want to go and really hammer Torkelson on oh, this one because it was so stupid. A 3-2 count. Uh, Kelly throws a knuckle curve in the left-handed batter's box. Torkelson checks up and just turns around, screams fuck, throws his bat on the ground, and pouts his way into the um, the, the the third base dugout. Um, buddy, there's one out. Run to first. Yeah. Um, and then the, bo the ball ricochets off Yaz right back to Joe Kelly. Joe Kelly glove flips it um, to Yaz, and he tags him right on the chest. Uh, nice tag, and, and Baez's foot was just like an inch away from the plate. Like, Baez was, like, almost scored. Yeah. <laughs> like, everyone's like, like they had him slid. out by a lot, but, like, that goofy little, mm -hmm. you know, dance step that he was doing at home kind of almost worked. <laughs> mm -hmm. El Magico. I just don't know, like, what they're teaching up there in Detroit. I know the White Sox do it often where they don't run after a drop third. That was a wild, wild pitch. It. I know you're mad, and I know it's the emotions are running wild, but you knew where you swung at the dead damn ball at. It was in the left hand of the batter's box. He didn't catch it. You swung. That's a drop third strike. Run! I don't know why A.J. Hinch had him back out there in first base. I know, you know, being punitive to players especially veterans is a bad thing but this is a rookie that they've sent down already because he wasn't hitting you got to send a message to this kid hey you've had a bad game a really bad game there you have to run that is a hard and fast rule for you specifically 
If you run there, it doesn't matter if Bias is throwing out. Yes, it does. It hurts. It's a second out. But at least you're on first. And then also, they have to make a decision. You run there. Maybe Joe Kelly's distracted by you running down the line, and he doesn't get Javi. And Javi comes home and slides like he usually does and does his magic. But that cost them a run dearly right there by the rookie not being heads up, understanding the situation, and letting his frustrations dictate what he did. Or there's one out. Yeah. What if Spencer Torkelson runs to first base and gets tagged out? What if, you know what I mean? What if Joe Kelly goes after him and then and Javi is sliding home and, you know, yeah. That's that could be the game right there. Yeah, you can now, bring- they ended up winning 3 to 2, so it doesn't, you know, in retrospect it doesn't really matter, but a big play right there. There was a huge defensive play by the White Sox. They caught a break with Torkelson not running to first base, but even regardless, they they make the play that they need to make on Baez at home. Give Joe Kelly the credit there. Give Yaz the credit for getting the tag where he needed to get it. Uh, yeah, you know, that at the at, in the moment, that play was gigantic. Yeah, it was fun, too. Uh, top and bottom of the ninth, the Tigers and White Sox can't do anything in the top of the tenth. Uh, Luis Robert, pinch runner extraordinaire, runs for Yasmani Grandal, but he is stranded as Alec Lang strikes out the side. Harrison, Andrews, and Moncada. And then in the bottom of the tenth, Liam Hendricks comes in. Sebi Zavala is his catcher. Willie Castro sacrificed. Liam Hendricks threw a slider over to first. Uh, Kreider... Kreidler went to third. Castro stayed at first. Uh, then Green struck out swinging. It was a nice little battle between Riley Green and Liam Hendricks. He got him on a fastball swinging. And then uh, Reyes hit a sacrifice uh, fly to center to end that game 3-2. to two. Uh, We'll talk about Matt Manning in a bit. But um, not really Liam's fault. Really only one ball that left the uh, infield. And it's just that stupid Manfred E-Man rule uh, coming back to bite the socks. <laughs> Manfred Man's earth band. But I <laughs> want to focus on the top of the 10th where – I know Lynn and Stoney were asking for a bunt there, and I'm anti-sacrifice bunt, especially in the top of the inning where you are have to set the pace for the inning, the extra innings. You have professional hitters there, and uh, Alec Lang, yes, he has great stuff, but bat on ball is the minimum there for Josh Harrison. He pretty much got down on four swings or four balls. Then Elvis Andres works his way into a 3-1 count. Sean Anderson over here. Look for that curveball. Look for that curveball. Look for that curveball. I'm like, you can't look curveball in 3-1. What did some bitch throw? Curveball right down the middle. Elvis is looking at that, and I understand that. 3-1, you're looking fastball. Then, after that, on a 3-2 pitch, Lang throws a low, but in the zone, 97-mile-per-hour fastball, and Elvis Andres is just looking at that one. I just don't understand what he was looking for there. Was he looking for the curveball again on a 3-2 count? If he throws that curveball again and gets it over, you just tip your cap. But right there, you should be looking for a fastball. A 97-mile-per-hour fastball. It strikes out. I don't know what he said to the umpire, but it hopefully wasn't like, was that a strike? Because it was a strike all day. Those two bats were really bad. And then Mancata swings at a ball in the dirt. You can't have three strikeouts when you have a runner at second. At very minimum, the first two batters failed, and I'd give a little leeway to Mancata, but also you got to pick your teammates up right there for not driving in the run, not even advancing Luis Robert. He didn't have any any exercise today. He's like, oh, guys, I feel great today. I did my job. You guys didn't do yours. It was just so sad to see another runner stay right exactly where he was when he started that inning off. Yeah, frustrating. Uh, White Sox went 2 of 12 with uh, runners in scoring position. It's not good. Uh, They left seven on base, so six hits. uh, They didn't have many guys on base to strand, uh, but it felt like if they had 11 base runners on base, they probably would have stranded 11. Uh, Just didn't feel like uh, uh, one of those nights for the Sox. Um, I did see Chi-Town fanboy saying Manning was terrible. So many balls right down the middle and did nothing. Uh, It's the story of their season. Their story of their season is absolutely getting toasted by no name right handers. Uh, Matt Manning, pretty decent, uh, former first round pick for the Tigers. Um, the fourth and, Manning brother. The fourth <laughs> Manning brother. Uh, and I also love the notes on the White Sox broadcast about Archie Manning being drafted by the Sox. In back to back years. In, they in wanted 70 him. and they 71. And he was like, nah, he knew the Sox were bad back then. He's like, I got this football thing. I'm going to give it a try. Mm-hmm. My, worked, my sons would be better than me, too. Worked out a bit. Maybe my grandson would be thing. much better than me. Hey, we'll see. <laughs> um, but uh, now I'm off because it's Arch Manning. Oh, Matt Manning. Uh, fourth Manning. Fourth Manning. Duh. Yeah. Um, I, I think people were probably expecting the White Sox to do well against Matt Manning because they had 10 hits off of him last time. Uh, Steven, if we could see Matt Manning's pitches from 8 13, 2022, um, this was Matt Manning Oof, throwing elevated. balls all over the place. He was throwing them 
very up in the zone against mm-hmm. the Sox. He spilled a bunch of Skittles all over that strike <laughs> spilled zone. a bunch of Skittles. I wish it was a green apple one instead of the lime. Skittle draft? Uh, no. Love okay. the tropical. I love the tropical. And the, what's the purple one? Wildberry, I think. What's the purple one? I think it's wi- Skittles. Just the regular berry. purple one in the regular mix? Yeah, Wildberry. Okay. Yeah, the berry one. The berry like one's good, one. and the tropical. That's the light blue. Yeah. The tropical one's real good. I used to do Slurpee in a bag of Skittles. Whew. Put the Skittles Sugar in the rush. Slurpee? Hey, baby. You saw my cereals. Um, <laughs> so let's go to Matt Manning real quick. Uh, 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 let's go to the Ooh, eight, eight, 8 o'clock. Uh, let's go to 8 o'clock. Uh, eighth month. Uh, there, no. The other one, sorry. Other, Sean, you're going to have to say some one. words. If oh, you he already has it. He has it up there on the bottom, but you can't <laughs> oh, see it. Oh, you have it up there in yeah. August. Okay, sorry. This I can't see it. Um, all right, so in, as you could see, I can't see. There um, it is. As you could see, uh, Matt Manning left a lot of balls up against the White Sox in August, and that's why the White Sox had a lot of hits. Um, but then let's go to the one from today. Matt Manning did a fantastic job yep. of not leaving balls up in the zone, and a lot of people saying, oh, it was in the middle of the plate. Well, the whole thing about sliders is they look like fastballs, and then they dart off, and fastballs, you know, you think they're going to dart off, and then, you know, the, the difference between it, you know, being 87 and 95, it just threw off. Matt Manning did a great job. He controlled the baseball. He wanted to throw. Uh, he kept the ball low, and he kept the ball where he wanted to, to, to uh, be. Um, this is how you neutralize the Sox, and you don't walk them. Uh, he didn't give up any walks today, and he let the defense behind him play. Um, and for the most part, they did their job. A couple of errors behind him, but um, the White Sox get beat by guys like this. When guys like this command their pitches, they lose. That's always been the story. That's been the story no matter what. Um, when they're getting high up in the zone fastballs, they need to do damage against them. That's the mainly frustrating games is because, you know, that, that those are the games that they should be doing get damage against uh, those type of pitchers. Um, when a guy does this, you know, this is like a, a Daniel Lynch type of night. This is a Brady Singer type of night. Just got to tip your cap because this guy was just good. I think so. I mean, I, I have a hard time giving credit to a guy that was – around the plate so much and he was in the in the zone so much yes he executed his pitchers and he was working his slider off his fastball so it could throw the White Sox timing off but I think the White Sox were just not executing what their plan was to get only the hits from Elvis Andres for the most part early in the game was frustrating he was the only one trying not trying he was the only one he saw what the team was bringing to the team and then he was like okay you're not going to be doing anything I'm going to force the issue remember the time I think it was Tim Anderson in Kansas City it might have been earlier this year got on first base stole second base stole third base got home created a run by himself because he knew that this team needed him Elvis Andres saw this team wasn't with it today and it wasn't necessarily like hey we're not going to give effort because they're all out there trying and doing what they can. But I don't know if their plan was right. They saw what he did last time, and it was the balls were elevated. And I saw in the pitch track right there that they were a little lower. But you have to adjust to that within the game. Hey, guys, he's doing this, that, and the other. Share some information because Elvis Andres was not having any problems seeing him. Rocket shot in the first inning. Rocket shot when he came back up in the second inning or the third inning. And then, you know, three hits today. Got on base four times. The man was not having any troubles with uh, Matt Manning. Everybody else in the White Sox lineup, for the most part, couldn't see him. Hey, two things can be true. Matt Manning was doing a good job. He was doing the job that he needed to do. And the White Sox were bad tonight. Mm -hmm. White Sox didn't make the adjustment, like you said. You know, listen, if we spent the entire first five months of the season saying, man, the White Sox should be beating the Detroit Tigers or, or teams like them. You know, they did beat the Detroit Tigers for the most part, but mm-hmm. teams like the Royals and, and, and other teams that are bottom of the standings that they were struggling against. Now, certainly, that the White Sox are finally playing like the team we thought they were going to be, they should be able to beat these guys. This is, not, this is not a game that the White Sox, when they're playing well, should be putting up. They should not be putting up two runs and only a handful of hits against the Detroit Tigers. That's, that's the bottom line. And, and no matter what we're going to say about what Lucas could have done better, oh, Liam shouldn't have made a bad throw to first base, any, any number of those things, guess what they should have done? They should have knocked the ball around the yard in Detroit. Not only have they already done it when they were playing bad earlier in the season, but they definitely should do it when they're playing like a, more like the lineup that was expected. And Vinny said it, like the pitching staff deserves zero blame today. Yeah, you could say Liam should have got him out of first, but things could have happened – Subsequently, if he does get him out, it, things are not linear. Things don't happen as they did when he does make that error if he does, doesn't make it. 
Liam did well for himself. Yes, the throw was terrible, but he gave up an honor and run. A guy was on second. They got two damn runs. To blame anybody on the pitching staff is ridiculous to me. And the bullpen itself with only the Jimmy Lambert home run given up, that was a good job. That was a really good job by the bullpen, good job by good enough job by Lucas, and a decent job by Liam Hendricks and Joe Kelly to get what they got. It's a tough day when your offense only gives you two runs. If you get two runs, you shouldn't win many but, games. But then again, Hendricks makes that play. There's two outs and that, that sacrifice. One out. No, but the, if you get Castro. Things not linear. It doesn't no, just continue. He, he bunted and was safe on the bunt. Yeah. There's one out. Yeah. But what I'm saying. Yeah. Or there, yeah, there would have been if one if out. But if he makes that throw to first, that, yep. then there's one out. Yes. Yeah. Then he gets Riley Green again. But, but it's the. Space time continuum. Now you're in a different reality. <laughs> I guess you're in a different reality. Right. The I things guess. don't continue here. That right. you've, you've didn't done. you watch season one of Loki, Sean? Come exactly. on, exactly. What? The things don't continue no. the same way. I did not do that. Um, I'm rewatching it, Stephen. How about you? Uh, I'm not rewatching. I wait yeah. until season two comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dorks. Yeah, big time. <laughs> what was that thing you were talking about today? That the uh, the Rogue One uh, offshoot. That's oh, yeah, out. the new Star Wars show. That's coming out later this week. Mm. It looks pretty good. I've heard they've been making a lot of good stuff at that Disney place. Hmm. Who Some knew? good stuff. Who knew? Some not so good stuff. They got a lot of money there? You got a lot of my money in Disney. Oh, well, boy. I'll tell you what. <laughs> oh, Jesus. We're doing, the, we're doing the Hawk stuff, so that means I must do a pins and aces read. Um, if you're a golf fanatic. Like, like the Hawk. Like, like Hawk the Hawk You know he cre- uh, created the uh, batting glove? That's how I invented the batting glove. Mercy. I came off the 18. I just forgot I had it on. Went up to bat. Crack. What is that, a hawkeroo? Mercy, I tell you, it's my, it's my golf swing. It's my golf club. Able, able to grip the bat better? Able to grip a nice bottle of Smirnoff better, too. <laughs> Mercy. Pins and Aces, the official <laughs> golf apparel partner of our Hawk of uh, Harrelson impersonations <laughs> and of CHGO. Hawk loves his Pins and Aces gear and gets a ton of compliments on and off the course. Mercy. Does dance. They're a family-owned the golf and apparel business. Mercy. <laughs> and they make amazing polos, hats, golf bags, and even our favorite beer sleeve. It was like a Hawk slash Mick Jagger there. It really was. <laughs> or with the hands on the hips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An innovative product that allows you to store seven beers right in your golf bag and drinks cold the entire Around. Check out pinsandaces.com and use code CHGO to receive 15% off your first order and get free shipping. That's pinsandaces.com. Again, check out pinsandaces.com. Use code CHGO to receive 15% off your first order and get free shipping. Uh, again, the beer sleeve, it holds seven beers. Even if you're not golfing, we know Chicagoans can figure out some use of a beer sleeve that holds seven beers. It fits really nicely in your golf bag, too. There you go. Seven Natterdays, too. Probably fits. You could replace your three wood and just put the, uh, the beer sleeve in there. No one's going to know the difference. Probably fits well in a backpack. Probably fits well in a purse if you've got a big enough one. You know? Probably just carry it around. Probably just carry it around. <laughs> Sling some beers around, all right? <laughs> so head over to David Snyder says you look smarter with the glasses. And Thank then you very much. I would say that. What Juan Hernandez's answer is, because you're the Sox math winner. Four-time Sox math winner. Reason Looks like you know some math. Four times. Hey, I got a calculator, friends. Uh, math is real easy when you just punch it in the computer, and it does when it you, for you. When you were a kid. Copy and paste, my friends. In class. I know you got to finish the read. Did they no, allow that's you. Uh, that's pinsandaces.com. Did they allow you to take your Texas Instruments 83, 83. into, te- into uh, doing homework and t- a test? Uh, it Did depended. Like the gra- on the graphing on what it calculator. Was. Depend on what the they don't allow us to do that. One was, I mean, like if you had to like, if they didn't want you to use the graphing part, they probably would be like, like no, do it longhand. They they made us do it longhand all the time. We couldn't use our calculators. Like, what the hell were you made us buy this goddamn thing for? I, I feel like they usually let me use the calculator because I remember using the calculator, getting the test done with in like five minutes, and then just playing Snake. Oh, oh yeah, we calculator. had the games on the calculator. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean that was the only yeah. thing. Sorry, mom. Yeah. I had the bad. I had the baseball. The baseball game on there. There was a baseball game. Oh yeah, baseball game. We had tons of games on the Jesus calculator. Christ, yeah. huh? I want the baseball game. Oh yeah, absolutely. I didn't that have sucks. the internet in high school at all. God, I, you, you didn't I, need the internet for this. No, but that's that's disappointing, Herb. Herb, <sighs> did you have to go to the library all the time? Ooh, Dewey Decimal System, microfiche. I knew all that stuff. <laughs> What's still microfiche? Do. It's the old stuff that stored like old newspapers. Yeah, they still have it. And then you go and look at it small. And then it blows up on this old ass screen, mm-hmm. so you can read old old ass articles that they've archived. Absolutely, you're, you're not library old. You're dial up old, right? Are you talking to me? Yeah, 
I mean, I'm, sorry, I was looking at you. Yeah, I mean, yes, but yeah, I mean, like I've I've been I've been in the uh, I think you've been in a library, been in the microfiche before. When okay. I was in college, I wrote a story about uh, there was a team, a football one year, the football team at Mizzou in like the late eighteen hundreds, you know, because college football is like old old as hell. Um, uh, went on a postseason tour of Mexico. Oof. And never came. Well, they came back, but they never came back when they were supposed to come back. Oh, oh. And so there, were, I had to go read all these uh, newspaper clippings about the team in the in the state historical society that was on campus from like 1893 or something. And it was like the language they used back then was was wild. Our Ooh. Pitskin team went to Mexico, yeah, and did not come back. A- absolutely, those scallywags. <laughs> it was just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Scoundrels. Oh boy. Oh, God. What do we make of this? This is coming from uh, James Vegan of The Athletic. Uh, Davis Martin is in town. White Sox do not have a roster move to announce presently. This was at 9.55. Um, not sure if it was due to Cueto, someone asked, uh, but Cueto's still present in the locker room, and Jeff Cohen from uh, AAA, uh, who covers them for Future Sox. Uh, he pitched one inning and 10 pitches on Thursday. So uh, Davis Martin has a fresh enough arm. I uh, wonder why he's been called up. I don't know. As long as Johnny Cueto and... Michael Kopech are scheduled to start. I didn't see anything wrong with either of those two in their last two starts. They should be pitching, and the bullpen's been well rested this week, so I don't know why his presence is there. You know, you could just be here to get some experience. I don't know. That's not entirely true, though. Hmm? Both games in Colorado, starters only went five innings. Yeah, but that and was tonight more. Lucas went fewer than five innings. So that was more because they ran out of pitches, right? Well, right, but I'm just saying it's not like those guys went seven and they only needed two bullpen pitchers in those games. They needed they've needed four. Four bullpen arms have three of the last four days. But all those pitchers were different pitchers. The first game in Colorado was correct, yes. was the bad the no bad, bad to backs, the right, bad yeah. bullpen bad bullpen and or the good bullpen and then the other day was the bad bullpen. They, but they all performed. They correct had They've no runs great. given. And then yeah. today was the first time they uh, got a run this week, I believe. Yeah, I think that's yeah. Correct. The bullpen's been pretty solid. Yeah, the bullpen's been very good. But I guess my point, the only thing I would bring up when you talk about Davis Martin doesn't have to start. Okay. Yeah, right? yeah, that's that's that is fair. Well, yeah. and I mean, last couple of times we've seen Davis Martin be used, he's been used with an opener. Or I mean, the last said, time, the last yeah, time right, we saw yeah. it, um, he's been. He and was maybe used an I don't know, like if they are thinking that Michael Kopech has so many troubles in the first inning, maybe use Davis Martin in the first inning on Sunday, depending on the results on Saturday, and how much bullpen they use, and just bring Michael Kopech in for the second inning, so he, you know, mentally thinks, hey, this is the second inning. I'm out of the inning. That is my bugaboo. Also, two guys like you know, they, I think the taxi squad is still a thing. Like he might just be there just in case because they're on the road. You know what I mean? So right. Davis Martin just begged. He's like, "I'd love Detroit. Can I go, guys? Please, 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 How please." Big is the, the taxi squad. How old is the taxi? How big squad? is it? It's like two or three guys. Okay. Yeah. Do you know? Could you take a guess on who's on the taxi squad currently? No. Davis Martin, probably. No. Usually you have to have a catcher on it. Okay. If if but those were old rules. Those they those those rules came into effect during the pandemic season. Right. You know, because they didn't want to mix. They wanted those guys to be in, in the bubble, so to speak. Um, Not mingle with the AAA guys. Well, right. They didn't want right. to pull, be pulling them from all corners of the country. You know, they wanted them to, to be in that bubble that they created for the teams. Um, but I believe it's still going on. So, you know, the last two years, I believe it's still been a thing. So gotcha. it could just be that uh, he happens to be spotted in the locker room and he's just there just in case. All right. Well, maybe Davis, maybe you will see Davis Martin uh, in the rest of the series. Uh, let's not. talk about uh, the game tomorrow. Wow. Herb, Herb's real anti Davis Martin. I'm not What's anti. Just say, if he's in the game, that means something went wrong. I mean, the time is kind of weird with another off to on Monday too. Yeah. It's weird. Then maybe he's like I said, maybe he's maybe just there he's just, just in case. Yeah. Guy in the bullpen guy in the bullpen gets hurt and maybe he's got nothing else to learn down in AAA and maybe they just don't want to use his arm unless it's going to be in really major league inning, time. Right? Maybe they're just shutting him down in the AAA season, you know? I don't know. Could be. I'm not too worried about it. Um, Saturday, we're going to see Johnny Cueto versus uh, Eduardo Rodriguez. Uh, and then on Sunday, we'll have a pregame show for you. Is it 1030? Yes. 1030. That's an Oof. 11 central start on yes. Sunday 10, because of the uh, the football game. Yeah, the, the football loins. game and then them being on the East Coast. So that's going to be Kopech versus Drew Hutchison. We'll be previewing that one on Sunday for Brunch you. with the boys. Uh, brunch with the boys at 1030 a.m. Uh, for Kopech versus time. Hutchison. Um, how are you feeling against going up against uh, Eduardo Rodriguez? I was scared the first time the White Sox faced him and they crushed him. So um, I believe that, you know, our lefty luck this year has not been with us as much. But it's time to eat. The White Sox have uh, an opportunity to grab a game 
like they should against the Detroit Tigers. The Tigers didn't play well today. They had two errors, should have been credited with three, only scored three runs in 11 innings or in 10 innings. The White Sox should have won this game. If uh, Eduardo Rodriguez is the guy that the White Sox saw earlier, I see no problem with them defeating them. And Johnny Cueto, for the most part, except for a couple blips on the radar, has been a solid, solid pitcher. Well, yeah, I want to bring this up. So Johnny Cueto's fastball, average fastball velocity on August 15th, 91.6. Then on the 20th, 90.2. Then on the 26th, 88.2. Then it was back up on September 1st to 91.1. Then on the 6th, it was down to 89.1, and then on the 11th, it was down to 88.8. So what do we make of this kind of dip in velocity that we've seen of Johnny Cueto? And, you know, does that mean, I mean, we've basically seen dip in velocity, bad results for Johnny Cueto. So the velocity kind of needs there, him uh, to be there for him to be effective. Yeah, I think I said it after we, we talked about his last start. Long season. Long season, a mm-hmm. lot of innings on that arm, and uh, a guy who didn't even really get a full real spring training. So uh, we saw guys run out of gas for this White Sox pitching staff last year. Uh, it is not surprising to see the uh, marathon of a season uh, have its effect, especially on a guy who has been uh, lauded for his longevity in games for basically the entire time that he's been in a White Sox uniform. So when you go six, seven, eight innings every time out, and that's a great thing, you're long more innings, you're, and you put more innings on that arm, and, and maybe uh, it being here at the end of September, um, you know, running out of gas a little bit. But it, it doesn't really matter because the Tigers have one of the worst offenses in baseball. All the White Sox got to do is score more than two runs. Yes. Mercy. I and mean, they might need to score more than three. I'm not saying that the Tigers are only going to score two, but right. you know what they need to do? They need to play a lot better than they did tonight. Well, those bats need to come alive, and if those bats come alive, they'll be fine. Real quick, I want to talk about Lucas uh, just because he wasn't bad tonight. If you're thinking uh, Lucas is the reason they lost the game, he could have been better. Four and two-thirds innings for Lucas. Um, he wasn't great. 96 pitches over those uh, innings. Four hits, though. One on run. Three walks. Five strikeouts. Um, and, and I do want to look at the pitch mix here just because um, it shows that the stuff was decent uh 51 fastballs 22 uh, change-ups 19 sliders four curveballs um the fastball was pretty mediocre 24 uh, percent called strike plus whiffs um but you look at the change-up 55 percent that's huge uh 70 percent whiff rate 10 swings seven whiffs that's awesome from lucas giolito's change up uh on his slider uh four whiffs on 11 strikes uh on 11 swings um he also got two called strikes so called strike Plus whiff percentage, 32%. Uh, MLB average, 27%. So the whole game, uh, he was at a called strike plus whiff percentage of 32. So that's very good from Lucas. Average exit velocity was 83.8. Um, 83. So the big thing that just hurt him was control and, and not putting batters away. Kept a couple innings alive uh, with some walks and, and some two-out walks. So uh, Lucas wasn't perfect. But again, like you said, Vinny, just got to score more runs. There's only one. There's only one number that I really look at when I look at all those stats from Lucas Giolito. That's the one earned run that he gave up. I mean, listen, the, the, the innings pitch obviously loomed big. He very badly, I'm sure, wanted to go seven innings tonight. He uh, was not able to do that by quite a significant margin. He's not going to be happy with those walks either, and that's what jacked the pitch count up, and that's what led to him coming out of this one pretty early. But he only gave up one run, and then the bullpen only gave up one earned run. Hit. And, score. That's what you need to do. And Lucas had a pitch in the Spencer Torkelson at bat where subsequently Spencer hit a RBI single, the only earned run he gave up, where he pitched the second pitch, and it was a strike. It was pretty much exactly where eventually the Elvis Andres pitch was when he was facing um, Alex Lang in the 10th inning. The ump in the 10th inning called that a strike. In Lucas' case, he called it a ball, and it was obvious strike right in the same spot that Alex Lang eventually threw the ball. And so the next pitch, Lucas throws an inside fastball, 93 miles per hour. Torkelson gets his hands in, gets the bat barrel to it, and gets an RBI single. That could have thrown him off. But he picked it up, and I think the biggest bugaboo today for Lucas was the walks. It drove up his pitch count. It frustrated him. It made for long innings for himself. That first inning, I think he threw, what, 25, 26 pitches. 28. Season, a 28 pages, so it's a, like a theme this week for the White Sox. They've been Four having a really tough first innings for themselves, so all he needs to do is eliminate those walks, and I think all you can ask for from Lucas at this point is five innings. He didn't get there today, but he gave his team a chance to win, and that's all you can ask for for today's game. 
But for looking for Lucas has to be much better than he was today. Tigers fouled off 12 of his four-seam fastballs, uh, 17 foul-offs uh, this entire game. So just over four and two-thirds. That has to be extremely frustrating for Lucas. Um, and again, just going back on the White Sox need to score runs. They have four losses this year against the Tigers. They lost seven to five back on July 8th. Then they, on uh, opening day, they lost 5-4. to four. Then on the 7th, it was the Dylan Cease game against uh, Bo Brisket or whatever the hell that guy's name was. They lost 2-1, to one, and then today they lose 3-2. to two. So uh, very, oh. very close games when they do lose to the Tigers. Um, just not able to put them away, put that final nail in the coffin. Um, and that, you know, you look back, and if the White Sox, you know, three games back of the, the Guardians, well, what if you won those games? And, you know, it's... Play a lot of what ifs uh, when you don't have a postseason. By the end of this weekend, we say that the only two losses at home for the Whites are on the road in Detroit were two walk off losses where we could have won those games. And that means that they won the last two games of this series and are looking to face Detroit or the Cleveland Guardians on Tuesday. And I hope the Minnesota Twins show up. That'd be great. We'll see you guys on Sunday at 1030 for the pregame of the White Sox and Tigers. It's Michael Kopech versus Drew Hutchison. Uh, We're off tomorrow. That's Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him on Twitter at ectorwall 23 And I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Thank you to Steven Nicholas for producing our show. Thank you to everybody hanging out with us on this Friday night. Dave, Matthew, Oz, Chi-Town fanboy, David, uh, Raul, uh, all you guys for hanging out we appreciate you um four-time Soxmath champion just want to brag one more time uh thank you to Fleetwood Mac for your 1979 album Tusk we will talk to you on Sunday go Sox